The production of this show is made possible by the support of viewers like you. Please visit conversationsthatmatter.tv and become a subscriber. The views and opinions of guests on this show are not a reflection of the views of the management or staff of this channel. Welcome to Conversations That Matter. Each week we have a one-on-one -on -one, in-depth interview with a thought leader on one of the major topics that we believe is going to shape the future of British Columbia. Joining me now is Mike Benier. Mike, how are you? Stu, good to see you. Good to see you. The issue today is land claims. Uh, not just the Chilcotin decision, but land claims in general. But the Chilcotin de decision has moved us towards having a conversation about what this means. Uh, give, me, give us a little context about that case and then tell us a bit about who is going to be occupying that seat once we get going here today. You know, this is big. I think you've hit on that, Stu, and I think it's most important for the First Nations because this is really landmark in that we're taking the understanding of land rights from what was historically kind of a postage stamp approach. In other words, where are you now and what are you doing now, that's your land, to this much more expansive definition of land rights. So the court has said, uh, the Supreme Court of Canada has basically said, we're going to go back historically, as far back as we can go, and listen to First Nations and understand the full geographic scope of where historically they hunted, they fished, uh, they trapped. And remember, these are historically nomadic people, so they've been over very large swaths of British Columbia. And so now suddenly we have a Supreme Court decision that upholds this, again, expansive concept of land rights. And it doesn't just say uh, you uh, have a legitimate claim. It's saying, yes, it's yours, here's the title. That's right. You not only have claim to the land, but you now also have claim to decide how the land is used, how it's managed, and to economically benefit uh, from the management of that land. So it's really provided, I think, a lot of clarity in one sense, if you ask First Nations, a lot of uncertainty if you ask other interests, like the economic community and even those in the provincial and federal government. So our guest today is Grand Chief Stuart Phillip. Uh, tell us a little bit about him. This is someone who has been on the scene in terms of First Nations leadership for a long, long time. He was head of the Okanagan Nation Alliance for many, many years, comes from the Penticton Band originally, and is now in his fifth three-year term as the Grand Chief of uh, the Union of BC Indigenous Chiefs. Now, the Grand Chief designation is not something we hear very often. This is a big deal, and this was given to him just this year, actually, by the Okanagan Nation Alliance in recognition of over 30 years of leadership. Uh, it has a really interesting personal story. He was taken from his Aboriginal parents as a very young boy, so he's very intimately and personally aware of the whole notion of personal freedom uh, and has been a very essential person in the the, the long-standing, what First Nations would call, struggle for the right to title. It was a fascinating conversation that we had with him in September 2014. Let us now go to that conversation. Thank you for joining me. Uh, these are very interesting and, as you have noted, uh, have, have the potential to be volatile times. What makes it so interesting right at the moment from your perspective in light of the Chilcotin decision? Well, I think um one needs to understand we've been involved in this fight for 150 years. It's not a new issue. And the Chilcotin decision is merely another Supreme Court decision that has come down in the favor of Indigenous peoples in the province of British Columbia. Not um, unlike the Calder decision that came down 41 years ago. Mm -hmm which really opened the door to the legal battle in the courts with respect to our, our unextinguished Aboriginal title interests in the land and resources within the province of British Columbia. There's been many, many Supreme Court decisions that have ruled in the favor of 
the uh, native people of the province of BC. Unextinguished, I think, is the key word there, isn't it? Absolutely. Um, most Canadians don't appreciate the fact that throughout Canada, we have a number of uh, what are referred to as the numbered treaties, which represent an agreement between the uh, government of Canada, between the federal crown and the uh, treaty people across the, this country and across the prairies, mm -hmm. whereby they have certain arrangements and understandings um, with respect to their territories. British Columbia, uh, by and large, does not feature any treaties. Um, there is um, Treaty 8 spills over into the northeast of the province of British Columbia, and there are a number of um, Douglas treaties that were uh, made under the auspices of uh, Governor, Governor Douglas back in the day. Mm -hmm. But by and large, BC is Indian land. Because that treaty process got abandoned going back to the 1890s, as I understand. Well, it's, BC has an interesting history. It, um, when it joined Confederation in 1871, it wasn't all that eager and willing to join Confederation. Uh, there were other considerations. Um, I believe there were overtures made from the U.S. Mm -hmm. And um, the negotiations were very intense. And there's an article of union, the Article 13, which BC insisted uh, be part of the arrangements. And Article 13 says, basically, that we can continue dispossessing and uh, shafting the native people as we have in the past because they did not, British Columbia did not want to follow suit uh, with the other treaty making arrangements that had happened across Canada whereby I believe each man, woman and child were allocated 650 acres. Uh, BC said um, that's not going to happen in British Columbia. And if you don't agree to this uh, provision, we're not going to join Confederation. So that set the stage for the long protracted history of denial of Indigenous land rights or Aboriginal title in the province of British Columbia. And quite frankly, we've been uh, fighting this issue ever since. And in the last 40 odd years, we've been slugging it out in the courts. We'll come back to that in just a moment. Stay with us. The views and opinions of guests on this show are not a reflection of the views of the management or staff of this channel. So what's the province going to look like as we move forward? What does this decision mean uh, in relations between uh, First Nations that do not have treaties with the province of British Columbia? And then what does it mean as far as a business model that works for everyone involved? Well, again, if one reflects on the number of Supreme Court decisions that have come down in the favor of the First Nations people in the province of British Columbia, uh, one would expect that there would have been a significant policy shift on the part of the provincial government quite some time ago. However, that has not happened. The government continues to conduct business as usual and is very, very reluctant to move and, and take direction from the Supreme Court of Canada. And so at the moment, in spite of the multitude of um, of court victories on behalf of First Nations, uh, the government continues to take up um, unextinguished Aboriginal title lands and to offer permits and licenses to third party interests, to industry and so on and so forth um, um, under the protest of First Nations people. The Chilcotin decision is incredibly significant uh, in terms of the nature and scope of the decision uh, without question, but the, the real issue is will the government of Canada and the province of British Columbia finally uh, say um, it's time that we view this as an opportunity 
an opportunity for Canadians and British Columbians embrace this decision and ensure that uh, we move forward in a manner that is in the best interests of all parties. Um, obviously, um, that hasn't happened. I know that uh, the decision came down on June the 26th. Uh, governments have admitted that uh, it represents a loss uh, with respect to the legal arguments that they put forward in the Supreme Court. Like many other uh, Indigenous leaders, I was actually in the Supreme Court of Canada when the legal arguments were made by all parties. And uh, we just had a meeting with Premier Clark and members of her cabinet last week. And the essence of the outcome of that meeting, although it was historic in nature, was the provincial officials at the end of the day said we're not there yet. So it's going to take a, a tremendous amount of hard work. I've said on many occasions, uh, reconciling um, Aboriginal title interests with Crown interests and other interests is going to be extremely challenging. And I've said publicly, recognition is not for wimps. Where are we at exactly right now? What is the province bringing to the table that you're saying not even close? Well, the province really, in reality, isn't bringing anything to the table. They're, um, again, the, the Premier is a, a consummate communicator. She said all the right things. Um, you know, she was quite, um, uh, quite emotional and, and uh, made some very moving remarks. But at the end of the day, there was really no commitment um, to undertake the, the challenge that is represented by the Chilcotin case. So when the province uh, are talking to individual First Nations about, you know, okay, well, here's how we settle that, are you saying that they're bringing virtually nothing to the table right at the moment? Yes, that's it. Uh, I mean, uh, we were expecting some you know, some definitive statements. After all, this was a very decisive decision mm -hmm. on the part of the Supreme Court. It was eight to nothing. And the Supreme Court was very clear. When our leaders met on a number of occasions in the aftermath of the, uh, the Chilcotin win, uh, the Williams case, um, many of our leaders um, were celebrating this victory and said at long last, uh, Canada and British Columbia recognize in every sense of the word in its full measure our unextinguished Aboriginal title interests. Grand Chief Ed John said no. He said that's not the case. He said let's be clear the Supreme Court of Canada recognizes our unextinguished Aboriginal title interests it's up to us to convince the rest of the country to, um, you know, to follow through and implement this decision. So what does have to come to the table? And I ask this because Chief Alphonse from the Chilcotin said, well, if they don't come with a better deal, uh, nothing's happening. Well, there's no question about that. Uh, the, the Supreme Court has declared Aboriginal title, made a declaration, uh, to 1,750 square kilometers of Chilcotin territory, which now is referred to as tidal lands. Um, I've had the privilege and the honor of standing on tidal lands during the many um, uh, ceremonies and celebrations that have taken place since. Mm -hmm. um, you can well imagine that in the aftermath of this decision, there are many, many issues that need to be addressed with respect to the jurisdictional dimension of, um, of taking up and owning land in, in terms of how that land will be managed. And there are countless pieces of legislation and orders in council and policies that need to be revisited in the face of this new reality. We'll be back in just a moment with more. The views and opinions of guests on this show are not a reflection of the views of the management or staff of this channel. 
So, so following the decision, in principle, it is the uh, title land to the Chilcotin, but has title been transferred? Like, is it uh, now uh, like a legal document that says this is yours and this is the, uh, the, the basis by which we start to move forward and then figure out how we work together? Or are we still... The short really answer is yes. The short answer is yes by virtue of the Supreme Court decision. Uh, being the highest uh, judicial authority in the country. It's the law of the land. As I say, the question now arises, how do we manage tidal lands? And the province of British Columbia, through the Premier herself, and the leaders of the Chilcotin National Government have signed off on a letter of understanding on initiating a process that will painstakingly address those issues as time unfolds. Um, the question arises, uh, what happens to the balance of British Columbia, which is unceded Aboriginal uh, title lands? Uh, the question is, do we slug it out in the courts in every instance for the some 194 First Nations that that are not part of the Chilcotin Nation? Or do we negotiate a reasonable uh, approach and process forward? And we had hoped at this historic meeting that took place last week that the Premier would send some unmistakable signals that now is the time to initiate such a process. But you didn't get those signals. Well, we have uh, four points that um, we have agreed upon that arose as uh, meetings between all of the leaders, all of the chiefs of the First Nations in the province of British Columbia. We met on uh, April 14th and 15th in Richmond mm -hmm. and there was a follow-up meeting on September the 9th and 10th, the two days just before we met with, uh, with Premier Clark and mm -hmm. what um, arose out of those four days of meetings was four points that we brought forward uh, to the Premier on September the 11th. And what are those four points? Well, those four points um, um, essentially indicate that um, there has been a, a paradigm shift that uh, we must move beyond this notion of recognition because the Supreme Court has, has done that, has, has answered that question. Now we need to get on with the business of implementing the Supreme Court decision. And that in order to do that, there has to be a complete uh, change in mindset. We need to look at uh, revenue sharing and new fiscal relationships with the province of British Columbia. There needs to be um, shared decision-making, which the courts have called for for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And most importantly, there needs to be an understanding that there has to be a, a reconciliation between indigenous legal orders and laws and existing uh, laws and legislation that will come into existence. So there's an expectation and an anticipation that the um, mandates will be changed to reflect the new reality of the Chilcot decision. But again, that remains to be seen because we're dealing with governments that are reluctant and very hesitant to follow through. Um, my worldview is a rising tide carries all boats. Mm -hmm. That once all is said and done, and there is a, a, a legislated reconciliation between our land rights and existing rights in the province of British Columbia, there will be for the very first time in 150 years economic certainty and all parties will benefit. And we will look back and wonder, you know, why did this take so long? Well, but between now and then there is uncertainty, is there not, for everybody involved? Yes, until such time as Canada and British Columbia accept the um, full weight of the reality of the Chilcotin decision and all other Supreme Court decisions that preceded this decision 
and say, let's quit dancing. Let's sit down and work this out. And uh, we're certainly uh, ready and uh, more than willing to do that. We'll come back to that in just a moment. Stay with us. The views and opinions of guests on this show are not a reflection of the views of the management or staff of this channel. For companies that are looking at making investments in large-scale projects that uh, depend on uh, the utilization of resources in British Columbia, what's your advice to them right now? Uh, should they wait and see? Should they say, there is a path and we can follow that? Um, uh, or do we go elsewhere? Well, I think that um, you know there there are attitudes, unfortunately, and and um, I suppose understandably in this world, um, there are racist attitudes out there, and certainly we've felt the full brunt of that. Um, my point is, smart companies, smart corporations, will. Um, you know, they, they will understand there has been a seismic shift and they will engage on that basis. So from your perspective, it's incumbent upon them to say, I'm not going to come in here and tell you what I'm doing. I'm coming here, first of all, to see whether or not uh, there's an opportunity. Uh, can we explore it? How do we explore it? How do we make that work for everybody? And, and if, that, if that is the environment and the, and the, and the mindset that they come with, uh, is from your perspective are you uh, like are you and, and other First Nations saying okay we can do business with you? I think that's uh, probably a pretty fair statement. Um, um, we're moving from um, a world of uh, and again it goes back to the Supreme Court decisions of consultation to consent. Mm -hmm. There's been a paradigm shift over to the consent side of the equation. Mm -hmm. And again, smart companies and corporations will know and understand that and begin to engage on, on a more respectful footing as opposed to thinking they're just going to be able to ram these projects through um, over the um, protests of First Nations people. That's not going to happen in today's world. Mm -hmm. And most importantly, uh, we have the law on our side. Uh, Chief Alphonse pointed out, he says, well, we have a great relationship with West Fraser uh, Timber uh, and have had for years. Uh, and why? Because they respect us, uh, they respect our right to be here, uh, and we have agreements that work for, our, for all parties involved. And so he's saying, we're open for business, but it has to be under the right conditions. Absolutely. I mean, it's common sense. Are you hopeful about the immediate future and from that Let's take, take a look 10, 20 years down, down the road. Where do, you, where do you see us at? Well, I have 14 grandchildren, so I have to be hopeful. I have to be optimistic. But at the same time, um, I'll be the first one to speak out when government begins to drag its feet. Uh, and, and I'm known for that. But yes, I am. I, I believe that we will this time. You know, we will learn from our more recent past and and realize it's better working together than you know being in constant opposition and so on and so forth. And so hopefully we are moving into a time of, of much greater uh, I think cooperation. We are. Yeah. I, I believe that. It's yeah. going to take a lot of work, a lot of challenge, leadership. Mm -hmm. You know we may have changes of government along the way but we'll get there. Yeah, on all sides. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Appreciate you doing this. To see the complete interview that you've just watched, please join us at our website.